first speaker, who's Jeff Settlement. It's a great pleasure to have Jeff back in the Boston area and welcome him back to MIT. For those of you that don't know, Jeff was a postdoctoral fellow um, with Bob Weinberg and has long had a uh, connection to MIT. Uh, after that, of course, as I think many of you know, he was uh, at Harvard School of Medicine. He was faculty since 1992. He was the Laurel Schwartz Professor of Oncology at Harvard Medical School uh, in 2008. And he was the director of the Center for Molecular Therapeutics and the scientific director of the Mass General Cancer Center uh, at that time. In 2010, he had a, a sudden revelation and uh, left Harvard uh, to to become the Senior Director of Discovery Oncology um, at Genentech, and it's a real pleasure um, to, to welcome uh, uh, Jeff here. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, it's really nice to be here and, and to have an opportunity to tell you about uh, some of the things going on in my lab that started here in Boston and have continued uh, at Genentech, where we have a lot of uh, the same interests in, in the context of, of uh, discovering new, new therapeutics for cancer. Um, and I'll talk about resistance, which uh, we've already heard some things about uh, drug resistance today. And uh, in particular, I want to talk about non-genetic, non-mutational aspects of, of resistance. Uh, and I'll tell you two stories. And they both relate to uh, resistance in the context of kinase inhibition. And of course, we've heard a lot about kinase inhibitors, and I think as everyone understands, there's a lot of excitement around uh, the successes that have been uh, experienced recently in recent years with selective kinase inhibitors. And just to show you here and remind you in this context of what we're now calling personalized cancer medicine, uh, we have inhibitors of kinases which undergo mutational activation in subsets of cancer patients, and these seem to define uh, patient populations that are uh, appropriate for treatment with uh, specific targeted therapies. So, for example, with HER2 amplification uh, treatment with HER2 inhibitors, such as uh, the antibody trastuzumab or Herceptin or Lipatinib, small molecule, BCR, ABL, ALK, similar uh, concept, EGFR, BRAF. So this, this theme has uh, been extended to a number of, of activated kinases now. Unfortunately, we seem to be running out of recurrently activated kinases, and so we're going to have to come up with more clever approaches to uh, finding new targets for, for drug discovery. Um, but, uh, and you've already seen this slide this morning from Michael Kahn, but I think it dramatically illustrates the, um, uh, the impressive clinical activity associated with some of these inhibitors as monotherapies uh, in the right patient context. So this is a, a BRAF mutant metastatic melanoma patient uh, <clears throat> with obvious uh, disease burden here, and, and you can see within 15 weeks of, of treatment, uh, a very dramatic clinical response. And unfortunately, clinical benefit in, in the context of, of this patient and, and really in, in the context of all patients treated with these uh, targeted kinase inhibitors, uh, we see the relatively rapid emergence of uh, drug resistance in, in virtually all patients. And so this is obviously an important problem uh, to deal with. And, and um, so there's been a lot of effort in understanding molecular mechanisms that drive resistance and to uh, use that information to develop strategies for combination therapies or alternative uh, treatment strategies. So we think about uh, where resistance might arise uh, within a tumor. Of course, we understand that there are probably subpopulations of tumor cells that have distinct properties, both uh, in terms of genotypic and, and phenotypic differences. Uh, and that, you know, in a simplistic view of the world, we can treat a tumor like this, and maybe uh, there's one large population of cells that are vulnerable to treatment and can be eradicated with therapy, but certainly at least one subpopulation of cells, which might vary in size from tumor to tumor, uh, which uh, is refractory to treatment and then might continue proliferating and, and repopulate the relapsed tumor on therapy. Um, now, I want to make the point that this kind of heterogeneity within tumors could potentially arise through both genetic and non-genetic mechanisms. So in a simple Darwinian view of the world, we would say that there might be uh, stochastically arising mutations that are present in a, in a tumor prior to therapy and that these are selected during therapy. But I hope to convince you that there may be other contributing factors to resistance that are not as, as uh, straightforward, at least from a genetic uh, or mutational standpoint. Um, so we know, for example, and this is work from uh, Jeff Engelman, uh, that when we look in, in one disease setting, non-small cell lung cancer, where a number of targeted therapies have been developed now, including EGFR inhibition in the context of EGFR mutant cancers, 
Uh, we understand that uh, there are discrete resistance mechanisms that have been well validated now, in particular, uh, the activation of, uh, of EGFR via a secondary mutation, T790M, that retains uh, catalytic function while um, disrupting the ability of drug to suppress uh, kinase output. And, and uh, this is seen in about half of all treated patients. <coughs> Amplification of the MET receptor, another uh, mutational mechanism that drives resistance. And then some mechanisms which seem less likely to be driven by mutational mechanisms, although we don't really know, for example, transformation uh, or differentiation to a small cell lung cancer phenotype, uh, and then some unknown mechanisms. And importantly, several of these have been uh, successfully modeled in the context of cancer cell lines. So we think this is a, a useful model system for exploring clinically relevant uh, resistance mechanisms. And I just want to show you an example of uh, a mechanism that we uh, elucidated through this kind of in vitro modeling of, of cells and cultures. So this is a, a study performed with a, a cell line called PC9. It's a non-small cell lung cancer derived cell line with an EGFR mutation. These cells are very sensitive to uh, EGFR inhibitors such as erlotinib. And so when we treat these cells over time for about a month here, we can see drug-resistant clones emerge at a frequency, in this case, of about 1 in 2,000 cells. They're quite resistant to drug, exhibiting greater than 400-fold uh, reduced drug sensitivity. Now, this is an IC50 curve just to show you that, that this drug, or lotinib, is very potent at killing most of these cells. And at pharmacologic concentrations, we can see what looks like you know, complete cell death on these dishes. And, and in fact, uh, when we look uh, macroscopically, just at, at uh, a dish of cells, we can see that after nine days of treatment, here are cells that are growing to confluence, that we pretty much clear the dish, although microscopically we can see a few cells that remain viable. And it turns out that a fraction of these then go on to form colonies, even though the drug is, is continuously provided. And we, we refer to these, and I'll use this term, these terms uh, quite a bit in the next few slides, as, as DTPs, or drug-tolerant persisters and that these are DTAPs, or drug-tolerant expanded persisters. And so <clears throat> one of the first things we wanted to do was to see whether this, this phenomenon could be extended beyond this PC9 model. And so we, we looked for these DTPs in a number of other contexts, including several other uh, disease settings where we knew of oncogenic drivers that rendered these cells uh, susceptible to treatment with small molecule inhibitors of those kinases. And in each case, we could detect these DTPs as scored by the number of residual cells after nine or 10 days uh, remaining on the dish. Now, importantly, um, <clears throat> these cells seem to emerge de novo within the population. And this experiment illustrates that. So this is an experiment using, again, the PC9 model. And in this case, what we've done is taken the starting cell population and derived single cell clones, and then repeated the same experiment, scoring the number of DTPs. And in each case, whether we look at clone A, B, or C, we see the same number of DTPs that we see in the parental cell. And that's illustrated here as well, that when clones grow out to form these DTEPs, uh, we also see that the same number of clones arise. And this leads us to conclude that these uh, cells emerge de novo within the population. Now, given the high frequency with which we saw the generation of resistance in this model, we thought that this might not be through a mutational mechanism. Uh, and if not, that it might be a reversible property of the cells. And, and to demonstrate that, we took one of these drug-resistant clones, in the GR7, and we took it out of drug for either four passages, 8, 12, 16, 20, et cetera. And then we asked whether it was, uh, its sensitivity to, to drug was, was, um, was recovered. And, and you can see here that the parental cell is very sensitive to drug. Uh, but And after 29 passages in the absence of drug, we see that uh, sensitivity has been restored to levels similar to those seen in the parental line. So it's a slowly reversible phenotype, this drug-tolerant phenotype. And consistent with a reversible, uh, a ver reversible nature uh, of the phenotype, um, we thought that epigenetic regulation might be playing a role. And consistent with that, these cells exhibit significantly altered uh, chromatin as measured in, in a number of different ways that I won't have time to show you. Uh, and I want to show you uh, how a couple of um, 
regulatory factors that influence chromatin structure have been identified that seem to be playing a role in establishing this, this drug tolerance state. So one of these is a protein that was mentioned earlier by uh, Bill Kalin. This is uh, KDM5A, also known as Jared one a or RBP2, uh, as he des first described it. This protein is significantly upregulated in the drug tolerant population, and as a consequence, uh, levels of its substrate, H3K4 methylation, both tri- and dimethylation, are reduced in the, drug, in the DTPs where it's overexpressed, so that's consistent. And if we knock down KDM5A, and then we ask what happens when we generate uh, erlotinib-tolerant clones, we can see in the control cells we get these erlotinib-tolerant clones after about a month. And if we knock down KDM5A, we can largely reduce the number of erlotinib-tolerant clones. However, knockdown of KDM5A is not, uh, does not have any effect on the overall proliferation of, of the cell population, uh, but only uh, in this context where we treat with erlotinib and look for clones do we see a phenotype associated with KDM5A uh, knockdown. Similarly, when we've looked at other histone marks that are differentially uh, regulated in the context of DTPs, we found that histone 3 lysine 14 acetylation was substantially reduced in the drug tolerant population. And when we treated cells with uh, a histone deacetylase inhibitor, in this case trichostatin A, we saw that while this was well tolerated in the PC9 cells, when we score apoptosis here, that these cells were very sensitive to TSA in, in terms of uh, their apoptotic response. So TSA seemed to effectively uh, kill the, the drug tolerant cells. And we looked at this in the context of their, the ability of, of trichostatin A to block the formation of drug tolerant clones in a few different settings. So again, starting with the PC9 model, untreated cells after a month grow to confluence. Trichostatin alone at this concentration didn't affect these cells. With erlotinib, we see drug tolerant clones emerge, but now we combine them and you can largely reduce the number of clones. Here's another EGFR mutant driven non-small cell line, same result, untreated cells grow to confluence, no effect of TSA or lotinib tolerant clones, largely reduced by the combination. Here's a BRAF mutant melanoma, so now extending it to another uh, oncogene-driven setting, untreated in TSA, no effect. Here we see BRAF inhibitor tolerant clones, and these are largely reduced by the combination. And now going beyond the kinase inhibitors, what we find is back to the PC9 model, which is also sensitive to uh, the chemotherapy drug cisplatin, we can generate tolerant clones, which are similarly reduced by uh, trichostatin. So what this suggests to us is that uh, there may be a reversible drug tolerant state that plays a role in the establishment of more stable uh, drug, drug resistant states that are seen in cancer. And so, of course, uh, we can imagine that within a drug sensitive population, as I mentioned, there could be mutations that arise stochastically that give rise directly to uh, a stable drug resistant cell, and we believe that these, these exist. Uh, but I think what the findings with the drug tolerant model suggest is that there may be intermediate states of uh, drug resistance that are reversible and potentially represent therapeutic opportunities. Uh, we've seen, at least preclinically, that HDAC inhibition and KDM5 inhibition uh, are effective in disrupting these states. There, uh, uh, we've recently performed an RNAi screen looking at other epigenetic regulators and found a few uh, potent hits that look very much like KDM5A in terms of their ability to, or their requirement uh, for the engagement of, of the drug tolerance state. Uh, there are now clinical studies going on to look at HDAC inhibitors in combination with some of these kinase targeted therapies such as erlotinib. And so we're eager to see how those play out clinically. We would anticipate that these would delay the onset of, of uh, uh, of resistance and, and perhaps extend uh, survival. So just to summarize this part, I've described a, a drug tolerant cancer cell subpopulation that might account for some non-mutational resistance to a variety of, of anti-cancer drugs. This is a state that can be spontaneously acquired and relinquished by individual cells within a largely drug sensitive population. And this implicates uh, some form of dynamic heterogeneity within tumor cell populations where these cells can arise de novo, perhaps maintain this phenotype for a transient period of time, and then relinquish the phenotype. We do think that because these cells suffer a, uh, in, their, in terms of their proliferative capacity, they pay a price for that. This is a phenotype that can't be stably maintained. And so somehow uh, within the cell population, 
there must be some uh, mechanism, maybe purely stochastic, but perhaps not, uh, that determines the percentage of cells uh, within a population that can maintain this phenotype at any point in time. And so, uh, again, the drug tolerant state seems to involve altered chromatin and can be pharmacologically disrupted. And this, of course, potentially yields a, a therapeutic opportunity to prevent the development of stable drug resistance. So uh, for the second part, what I wanted to uh, come back to was uh, first to remind you about um, some of the themes that we've learned from understanding mechanisms of resistance that arise, for example, in the context of BRAF inhibitors and, and EGFR inhibitors. Uh, these are just uh, schematics that summarize some of the um, resistance mechanisms that have been reported, either uh, identified preclinically in some cases or, or certainly confirmed clinically in, in other cases. Um, but there are a variety of resistance mechanisms, and in many cases, uh, the, the key theme seems to be the engagement of, of common effectors of, of some of these oncogenic kinases. And this is illustrated more clearly, I think, here, where we can see a number of the potentially oncogenic receptor tyrosine kinases, the RTKs shown here on the, on the cell surface, as well as other oncogenic kinases such as ALK or bcr ABO or BRAF. Uh, one of the common themes here is that uh, two major nodes, and, and perhaps more, uh, PI3 kinase and MAPK uh, nodes that are important for cell proliferation and survival, can be engaged by many of these uh, mutationally activated kinases. And this, of course, um, potentially uh, points to some kind of redundancy that, that uh, might impinge on or might play a role in cancer cells uh, when we attempt to inhibit one or more of these pathways. We heard from Joan about feedback regulation, uh, but there may be redundancy uh, as well at the level of the growth factors for these RTKs themselves. And that's, that's the uh, theme that I want to talk about for the next few minutes. So we know that um, these receptors, of course, have uh, associated ligands that are produced either by tumor cells or through the tumor stroma or could be produced systemically in, in cancer patients. And what we wanted to ask was whether simply having these things around in the tumor microenvironment could impact the efficacy of small molecule kinase inhibitors on cancer cells by virtue of, of transducing potentially redundant signals that converge on these same important survival nodes. And so, of course, within the tumor microenvironment, there are a number of sources of potential resistance-promoting growth factors. Of course, the tumor cell itself could be producing something in an autocrine fashion. Uh, we also have cancer-associated fibroblasts and, and infiltrating immune cells, uh, perhaps endothelial cells. Uh, so there are a number of, of sources of, of factors that might be contributing to uh, signaling through these, these shared uh, effector nodes and might impact the ability of tumor cells to respond to kinase inhibition. So we wanted to test this experimentally uh, in, in a cell culture model system. And so this was the experimental setup. We took a number of kinase addicted cancer cells. So these were tumor cell lines where we knew about some kind of mutational activation event that defined a, a state of oncogenic kinase addiction and a vulnerability to an effective kinase inhibitor. And so in each case, um, uh, we had a matched inhibitor that could be used to target these cells and effectively uh, uh, inhibit the growth of, of um, the vast majority of cells on the dish. We simply wanted to ask whether taking any of these six ligands that we chose based on uh, their association with either receptors that are known to drive cancer or their expression in tumors. Uh, and we asked whether uh, adding these two cell lines that uh, are, have a dependency on these, these kinases could impact their sensitivity to kinase inhibition. So here's the summary of a large set of data. And I just want to make a couple points here to show you what we saw uh, from a high level view. Uh, first of all, um, we used 41 different cell lines, and they're all listed here with, with their kinase addiction described here. And here are our six growth factors here. And so what this matrix describes is the effect of the growth factor on the response to treatment with uh, inhibitors of uh, the kinases to which these seem to be addicted. So we got basically three types of, of responses to growth factor. Here's an example where there was no rescue by the growth factor, no rescue from drugs, drug sensitivity. Uh, so here's a, a, a breast cancer cell treated with lipatinib. It's sensitive to lipatinib, but we add a growth factor, in this case HGF, the ligand for the MET kinase, and we see no effect. 
Here's another example uh, of a, a lapatinib-treated cell where uh, HGF shifted the IC50 curve uh, significantly uh, for um, sensitivity to lapatinib. That we consider partial rescue. Those are colored in blue here. And then essentially a complete rescue was seen in a number of cases. Uh, in this one, lapatinib treatment versus lapatinib treatment in the presence of the HER3 ligand, neuregulin-1, where we see virtually complete rescue from, from drug sensitivity. So a couple things to point out in this uh, overall data summary here. One is that we saw a lot of rescue just by through these, these six factors. And again, there are hundreds of factors that potentially could impact the cell surface of, of a tumor cell. But these six factors uh, could, could uh, contribute in, in a large number of settings to resistance to various uh, inhibitors. Uh, so the only one that didn't show any activity was PDGF, shown here. Uh, and some factors, such as HGF, which I'm going to focus on a little bit, showed quite a large range of activity across a number of treatment settings. Uh, also worth pointing out that in many cases, uh, three or even four different growth factors within the same cell line were sufficient to uh, confer resistance to the growth factor treatment in that setting, suggesting that uh, not only are these cells present, uh, have not only do these individual tumor cells have multiple factors on their surface, but they have multiple, uh, multiple receptors. They have multiple receptors that are capable of transducing a key survival effector signal uh, when ligand is provided. So in terms of uh, signal output and, and this notion of redundancy through these two major nodes, we focused again on the, the ERK and PI3 kinase uh, AKT pathway. So we read out phospho-AKT and phospho-ERK as uh, surrogates of, of the pathway readout here. And, and so uh, what we saw in each case where we saw rescue, we saw that either ERK or AKT or both were engaged by the addition of, of a ligand that could rescue cells from sensitivity. So just to show three different examples here, uh, this is one of the cell lines, a breast cancer line, HER2 amplified, sensitive to the HER2 inhibitor lapatinib. And here are uh, the different growth factors added. And here's the degree of rescue. Again, green is complete rescue. Blue is partial rescue. White, no rescue. You can see that lapatinib, as expected, uh, suppresses phospho-HER2, phospho-AKT, phospho-ERK. And if you add factors that can rescue, uh, HGF, FGF, neuregulin, EGF, you see either AKT, ERK, uh, or both uh, would be um, engaged. And, and this was seen as well in uh, a MET-amplified gastric cancer cell line sensitive to the MET-ALK dual inhibitor crizotinib, which you heard about earlier. Again, looking at the cells that are rescued, these three lines, we see either engagement of ERK uh, or AKT and ERK um, in, this, in the settings where these were uh, rescued, but we didn't see activation of those nodes in cells that were not rescued, similar result in this EGFR mutant lung cancer cell line. So I want to tell you briefly about three examples of uh, the data that came out of, of this overall analysis that may have some clinical relevance. And they all three relate to uh, HGF as a rescue factor. Uh, in the context of, uh, of, of kinase inhibitor sensitivity. So here's, here's example one. And in this case, uh, we're looking at um, this uh, EML4 ALK translocated lung cancer line. You heard from Michael Combe about how this is a, a line that's driven uh, by ALK. It's addicted to ALK, and it's sensitive to ALK inhibitors. So here's an ALK inhibitor, TAE684, which you can see it's very sensitive to. Uh, and when we add HGF to these cells, uh, they're very nicely rescued from sensitivity to ALK inhibition by HGF, which again engages the, the MET kinase. Um, interestingly, when we took these same cells, H3122, and treated with crizotinib, the dual MET ALK inhibitor, which they're also very sensitive to, because it is an ALK inhibitor after all, now we add HGF and we, in the presence of crizotinib, uh, these cells are not rescued. Now, this makes sense because HGF activates MET and crizotinib hits both MET and ALK. Now, why do we think this might be clinically relevant? Well, that's because crizotinib actually works 
better than many expected in the setting of ALK transloca translocated lung cancers. Uh, better than expected meaning not in terms of the response rate, but in terms of the duration of responses. And one possibility is that the reason it works so well is because it also hits MET. And so uh, it's going to be difficult, of course, to, to prove that because that's the inhibitor that's being used clinically. And so we won't see MET as a resistance mechanism arise in this setting. But perhaps if other ALK inhibitors are developed uh, clinically, uh, this could be explored. Uh, biochemically, we can see that, um, again, there is, in fact, when HGF is added to these cells, engagement of, of phospho-MET and AKT and ERK, uh, and that that's nicely suppressed by uh, crizotinib. Even in the presence of HGF, you can see uh, no signaling through MET in, in, in these cells. So that's consistent with, uh, uh, with the uh, data shown here. So uh, the second example, again, relates to HGF, this time in the context of HER2-amplified breast cancer cells, uh, which also, in some cases, express MET. So if we just look at a panel of HER2-amplified breast cancer cells, in this case, Three of these were rescued from sensitivity to lapatinib by HGF. All three of them expressed some level of MET. In fact, this one had pretty high levels of phospho-MET, even without adding HGF. Uh, it turns out in human breast cancer samples, when we looked by IHC, we found that 5 out of 10 HER2-positive breast cancers have some percentage, of, a small percentage of cells that has clearly stain positive for MET. Uh, and that a smaller percentage of cells shows a significant fraction of, uh, you know, in this case, I think 30% of cells showing clear MET positive staining. So MET is certainly expressed uh, to varying degrees in, in HER2 amplified breast cancers. We can show here in a cell culture model of resistance where cells grow to confluence here, we treat with lapatinib, we can see drug tolerant clones after about 12 days. If we add HGF plus lapatinib, we can rescue cells from lapatinib. But if we combine now with crozotinib, the MET inhibitor, we can nicely suppress that. So this, this ability of HGF to rescue these cells from, from the sensitivity to lapatinib seems to be driven by the MET kinase. And in, if we look biochemically in this setting, here is uh, an example of a, um, one of the MET-negative breast cancer cells. So this is a cell line that's not rescued from lapatinib by HGF versus two cell lines that are MET-positive and are rescued. Uh, we can look at the biochemistry, and it's consistent with the model we're proposing. So in the MET-negative line, of course, lapatinib nicely suppresses HER2 and downstream AKT and ERK signaling, and HGF has no ability to restore that downstream signaling in this context. Whereas in these two MET positive lines, again, lapatinib, of course, nicely suppresses signaling. But even in the presence of lapatinib, HGF can activate AKT and ERK signaling in both cases. Uh, and this is suppressed by the MET inhibitor crizotinib. So this would implicate uh, HGF as con potentially contributing to the response to lapatinib in a subset of uh, HER2 amplified breast cancers. And then the third clinical implication, which again relates to HGF, is in the context of BRAF mutant melanoma cells. So of course, uh, so PLX, uh, this PLX molecule, also known as, as vemurafenib, is the BRAF inhibitor now approved for clinical use in the setting of BRAF mutant melanoma. And here we're looking at a panel of cell lines uh, where BRAF, these are all BRAF mutant melanoma cell lines that were rescued to varying degrees with the, uh, just simply by including HGF in the um, supplemental HGF in, in the analysis. And so on to the left of this red hashed line here are cells that were either partially or completely rescued uh, by um, HGF addition. And then on the right, cells were not rescued. And what you can see, I think, is that uh, there's some degree of correlation, and that's plotted here, between the levels of MET in, that's, that are detectable in these cells and the ability of uh, HGF to rescue uh, cells. It's not a perfect correlation. And interestingly, even in settings where we see very little or no detectable MET expression, we can still get some partial rescue with HGF. Now, since MET is the only known receptor for HGF, we presume that HGF is driving this uh, rescue via the MET kinase. And it would, that would suggest that even a small amount of MET uh, goes a long way in this setting. 
So again, looking biochemically, and here we're comparing three different HGF rescued BRAF mutant melanoma cells with two non-HGF rescued BRAF mutant melanoma cells. And in, let's start with the non-rescued cells. You can see there's no MET, and when we add HGF, there's no phosphomet, uh, and there's no, um, and here we're particularly focused on ERK, which is downstream of, of the activated RAF kinase. You can see that uh, the vemurafenib or PLX nicely suppresses ERK here, and that that is not restored by HGF. However, in these three lines, which are rescued by HGF, uh, HGF will engage phosphomet in each case. You'll see downstream activation of AKT and ERK by MET. And importantly, the phospho ERK uh, output here uh, is nicely suppressed by crizotinib in all cases, suggesting that, again, MET is driving uh, this increase in ERK activity, even in the presence of the BRAF uh, inhibitor in those cells. So, is this clinically relevant? Well, we took advantage of uh, the uh, clinical material from, uh, in this case, the BRIM2 phase two study of BRAF mutant melanoma patients. These were BRAF mutant melanoma patients that were all treated with vemurafenib. And what we looked at in this case was their levels of plasma HGF. So we're, here we're looking at systemic circulating HGF, which varies significantly among cancer patients, and give, gave us an opportunity to ask uh, a simple question, which is not really the ideal question, but given the limited access to uh, tissue, this was a question we wanted to start with. And the question was whether levels of plasma HGF would influence the clinical outcome of patients on this uh, BRAF inhibitor therapy. So what we're looking at here are two, two graphs. One is progression-free survival and one is overall survival. And what we've done here is divide these patients along a median that defines their level of HGF. So in uh, red, we have patients that were HGF high, that is above the median, and in green, they're below the median. And what we can see is a very statistically significant uh, difference between their survival levels, with levels of higher HGF, HGF being uh, associated with uh, reduced survival, reduced benefit from therapy, although it's unclear from this analysis whether this is a prognostic or a predictive biomarker of the response to treatment or the outcome on treatment, uh, because again, in this trial, the patients all received uh, therapy. So regardless, it, it implicates HGF and presumably MET signaling in the clinical outcome of BRAF mutant melanoma patients. Now, just um, to end with uh, one more data slide that uh, doesn't really show you much in the way of specific data, but just to tell you where we're going with this kind of observation. Uh, we've now expanded from our six factors to a much broader screen that includes about 450 secreted factors uh, representing all kinds of cytokines and, and growth factors. And we've now expanded the matrix to include uh, other drugs and other cell lines. And basically what we can do through this analysis is uh, generate um, this kind of heat map, which uh, in red here is rescue. And so what we're looking at is cases where we're trying to find other examples where specific cytokines uh, or growth factors might be contributing to resistance in, in certain settings. You can see here with, with some growth factors, we might get sort of uniform uh, rescue. Uh, regardless of the cell line or the drug type, which is kind of curious, and, and we're exploring that. In other cases, it's restricted to the tissue type. So we see here, you know, examples in, in melanoma that we don't really see much in, in breast, and similar here in breast that we don't see in melanoma. And then, of course, differences uh, between drugs in some cases as well. So this is, analysis is ongoing, and hopefully there will be more to report there in terms of specifics soon enough. Um, so just to summarize, this kind of uh, cell-based matrix screen revealed a potentially broad role for RTK ligands in limiting the overall clinical benefit uh, associated with kinase inhibition. We saw that ligand-mediated rescue from drug sensitivity uh, was well correlated with reactivation of what we might call redundant uh, or convergent pro-survival and proliferation pathways. We focused on ERK and AKT, not, not to say that those were the only pathways that are likely to be contributing, but certainly they seem to be uh, important nodes in this context. Uh, and we showed uh, examples where HGF in particular seemed to be widely active in terms of promoting resistance 
uh, in a variety of different kinase addiction contexts. Uh, and so, you know, collectively, these results would, would implicate secreted factors uh, in, in contributing to resistance, either by being produced in tumor cells or perhaps by tumor stroma or even uh, uh, provided systemically through other sources that might limit the activity of the various kinase-targeted uh, drugs and, and therefore might constitute uh, some attractive targets for combination drug therapy. And this is something we're quite interested in, in exploring. So uh, I'll end there and just acknowledge some key contributors. There are a lot, a lot of people contributed, but I want to particularly highlight uh, the contributions of, of Sri Sharma and Marie Clausen to the drug tolerance work. And uh, Tim Wilson and Rich Neve were, were the key contributors to um, uh, the cell matrix uh, rescue studies. So I'll end there if we have time for a couple questions. Thanks. Yeah, we'll take a couple folks that might have. Yes. I just wonder whether you look into uh, kidney cancer in relation to KDM5 studies because KDM5 is often mutated in kidney cancer and those are inactivating mutations. I was just wondering whether you looked at whether you can um, make kidney cancer cells resistant under um, you know, protracted uh, treatment with, uh, for example, Everolimus, as it is used in the clinic, and showing that KDM5 cannot play that type of resistance. So I'm, I'm not aware of activating mutations? No, it's inactivating. That's what I'm saying. So KDM5 would be always inactive in those cases, right? It's 5C. Yeah, it's 5C. KDM5C. Yeah, which so we haven't looked at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we haven't looked at 5C. George Bendewitt has pointed out or stated that uh, mouse HGF doesn't really engage the human C-Met very well. And for right. that reason, he cautions that in studying tumor xenografts and immunocompromised mice, we may overlook the importance of HGF. Is that something you agree with? Is that you yeah, um, so I do agree with that. And in fact, we, um, I didn't have time to show it, but we we wanted to show the, uh, we wanted to, follow up on and validate the HGF met melanoma result in an animal model, in a mouse xenograft model. And to do that, we used an antibody agonist of, uh, of met since we couldn't use HGF. And that, that worked out nicely. But so yes, I agree with, with George's assessment of that. Yeah. And by the way, that, I think that cross-species ligand receptor issue obviously could complicate the analysis of a lot of these findings. We need to let uh, Jeff catch his flight, so let's thank him for an inspiring right. talk here. Thanks,